Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third press conference of EGU 23, which is the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. I'm Gillian D'Souza. I'm EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I'm happy to introduce you to our wonderful speakers who are joining us today. Um, they have their, their research and abstracts have been shortlisted out of 17,000 papers that were submitted this year for the meeting. So that's very exciting. And they are going to present some of the most unique findings in the geosciences with you today. So each press conference uh, will have time for the speakers to make their presentations in individually. And then we will conclude in the last 10 to 15 minutes with a media question and answer round. For those of you who are joining us virtually, I ask that you mute your microphones until we get to the Q&A round at the end. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists for today so that there's faster transitions between all. Our press conference is titled Humans, Hominoids and Extraterrestrials. Our speakers today are Taras Geria from ETH Zurich, Institute of Geophysics, Department of Earth Sciences. Then we are joined in the center by Jill Ramstein from CEA Sacle, LSCE France. Nice to meet you. And finally, by Thomas Litt from the University of Bonn, Germany. So welcome again, and we are ready to have their presentations. The order for the presentations, however, we will be listening uh, first to Taras, followed by Thomas, and then from Jill. So, um, hope you enjoy today, and thank you again. Over to you, speakers. I thought that uh, it will show anything on the screen or the camera. Okay, <clears throat> so here is uh, our work with uh, Bob Stern from UT Dallas. And we are working together <clears throat> on trying to understand relationship between life evolution and plate tectonics. And we believe that findings from this work, they're helping to understand the well-known paradox of missing extraterrestrial civilizations. Uh, please, next slide. It's well known um, that no any extraterrestrial civilization is, is communicating with us, and we are wonder why. So. The take home message from our study is that the reason for these missing civilizations is that they can only be expected on planets with ocean continents and plate tectonics. And these planets are extremely rare and you know can be expected as with probability of much less than 1% among the habitable planets with primitive life. Next slide, please. So why do we need plate tectonics? Plate tectonics is needed for accelerating evolution of complex life. So in general, life evolution is extremely slow. On Earth, it took more than three and a half billions of years to develop our civilization. And then, of course, any processes that are speeding up the evolution, they're playing a very important role. So um, plate tectonic, what it does first is suppresses extreme volcanic events, which become less frequent because heat is released in a distributed long-term manner along the grain boundary, uh, along the plate boundaries. And second, what it does, it produces continuously changing, stimulating environment for species to evolve. So it stimulates biodiversity, and more importantly, it operates on the time scales of uh, life evolution. So not too rapidly and not too slowly. <clears throat> uh, therefore, we need plate tectonics, and plate tectonics are very rare among the terrestrial planets. So there are probably many planets which are hosting primitive life, but they have little chances to evolve into complex life. So please, next slide. <coughs> so why oceans and continents are needed? It's to provide optimal environment to evolve from simple life to complex life, and finally to intelligent life and civilization. So. Um, Oceans are good in hosting primitive life and protecting it from, for example, um, radiation, uh, providing structural support, providing optimal distribution of nutrition. But then continents are needed for complex life 
to you know experience these relatively hostile environments which stimulates many bioassets to develop complex appendages for example you know these uh, opposable fingers of primates and so on and um, this in fact also a good environment for exploring fire and electricity and to finally develop intelligent life and civilization so on a planet if we would like to move from primitive life to complex life and civilizations in addition to plate tectonics we also need this uh, continents and ocean to coexist for very long time during the entire planetary evolution and this is again rare to be expected so please next slide so then what we suggest on the basis of our research is to do the following if we would like to compute how big is the fraction of planets with life which can develop into intelligent life and civilizations we have to multiply two probabilities so we have to multiply probability of such a planet to host continents and oceans for a long time and the probability to host plate tectonics for a long time and both probabilities are very low and then the product of this multiplication is even lower it's much much less than one percent next slide please so in our galaxy there are many planets they start at different times with their star system and they develop uh, through time in parallel with each other many of these planets they have good conditions for life and many probably develop primitive life however only very rarely these planets they can have continents oceans and plate tectonics which help developing uh, intelligent life and civilizations probably there were some civilizations before us or there will be probably some civilizations after us but they are so rare that they do not cross with our communication window so we are from this perspective doomed to be alone so next slide please this is the final slide if you are interested to learn more about relationship between life evolution and plate tectonics so please watch this five minutes video recorded by Bob Stern on YouTube where he presents results from our team of researchers working on the relationship between life evolution and plate tectonics thank you for your attention thank you we will now hear from thomas whenever you're ready good morning everybody um, it is well known that uh, the cradle of modern humans uh, is situated in Africa with the oldest evidence around 300,000 years um, before present or 200,000 years before present in East Africa. And this is also well known that the first occurrence of modern humans, uh, the arrival in Europe took place around uh, uh, 450,000 years ago. And the Levant corridor um, is um, a very uh, important route, track route, for the expansion and migration to Eurasia. And uh, to highlight what I would like to tell um, during these eight minutes is that we have one, several occupation phases of modern humans in the southern Levant. And uh, as a um, very important result of our study and investigations, we have the first continuous vegetation and climate record of the Southern Levant based on a Dead Sea drill core encompassing the last 220,000 years. Means this is our archive where we are able to reconstruct uh, the climate system and even the environment. And um, we observe based on this uh, climate record that uh, we have green corridors between Africa and the Levant during warm and humid phases, which we can uh, uh, identify. And so finally, the Levant is a huge area with a mixture of ecosystems and uh, sufficient water availability. You can say this is the Garden of Eden for the modern, as a modern human when uh, he arrived in Eurasia. Okay, uh, let's start with um, this um, geographical map. And uh, the Levant is the only permanent land bridge between Africa and Eurasia during the Quaternary. And uh, the present day Sahara 
and southern Levant with the Sinai and Negev desert is a barrier. And during this climate and environment conditions, this is impossible to move from Africa to the Levant or to uh, Eurasia. And a uh, green corridor is necessary for the migration of the modern humans. And the question is when and why. And here you can see the uh, first evidence of modern humans, um, the Mislia caves around 180,000 years uh, up to 190,000 years before present. Then last warm stage, interglacial stage, 120 up to 90,000 uh, years BP. The school and Kraft C caves, this is a uh, quite older record, well known, and Manot cave, pretty new, 55,000 years BP. And uh, from the paleogenetic point of view, this is a type which uh, arrived successfully in Europe, Asia, and even uh, America. So this means there's no continuation from this first record up to this um, Manot cave record. Jordan Rift and Dead Sea from the geological point of view, a fascinating area. Um, this is uh, the boundary, if you want, between the African plate um, at uh, the west and the Arabian plate at the east. And you can see the Dead Sea Basin and more to the north, this is the Sea of Galilee. And these are excellent archives for paleoecology and paleoclimatology. By the way, um, the Dead Sea shore area is the lowest point on the Earth's surface worldwide, with minus 420 meter below the recent sea level. We obtained cores um, based on an international drilling campaign um, under the umbrella of the International Continental Scientific uh, Drilling um, Program. And uh, we used a barge system, quite large, uh, the so-called Deep Lake Drilling System. And we obtained cores in the Northern Dead Sea Basin uh, in water depths uh, of 300 meter, and we obtain cores uh, up to 450 meter sediment, um, encompassing the last 220,000 years. So this means we have all these uh, expansion phases of modern humans in this record. Um, pollen analysis is based on several reasons. One of the most important um, paleoecological method to reconstruct environment and even climate. And we uh, took samples from this core and we have to uh, prepare these samples with chemical treatment to remove uh, mineral particles and so on. For example, HCl for calcium carbonate or even HF, quite dangerous to remove all these mineral particles, quartz, and so on. And then we concentrate um, the residue, and under the microscope, we are able to identify pollen. And the advantage is uh, pollen do not decay in lake sediments, and they can be preserved over 100,000 years, even million years. And uh, so we can uh, really see uh, which plants grew in this surrounding area and plants uh, cannot move. Uh, they uh, are in a balance and equilibrium with the climate uh, parameters like temperature or precipitation. And we can use this relationship. And at the end, we have a calculation and interpretation of um, this record based on pollen diagrams to see quantitative changes of the vegetation type and um, even the amount of um, special plants can be observed based on this calculation. So at the end, we use um, the uh, knowledge of the vegetation history um, simplified uh, above this diagram, only the relation between trees and shrubs, but we have the whole assemblage of uh, the evidence of plant species um, available, and we calculate this based on uh, transfer functions. This is a statistical method. We developed this method together with the meteorologists in Bonn, and we are able to quantify the, um, um, the 
uh, relationship between uh, plant distribution area and uh, precipitation or temperature, as you can see. Um, as a winter temperature, you can see we have changes of the system through time. We have more mild winter temperatures, which can be observed in this diagram. And if you have a look um, below to the annual precipitation, you can really see peaks of higher phases uh, with precipitation based on uh, this um, pollen record. And um, this is not uh, surprising, I would say, but we are happy to see this correspondence between um, the occurrence of modern humans uh, in the Levant, uh, which are clearly related and connected to more humid phases, means we have a corridor. Um, the corridor was open uh, and the Levant was like a bridge. Uh, and uh, then um, this is the case for Mislia, the oldest evidence, uh, Kafzi and Skul for 120,000 up to 90,000 years. And finally, the last migration wave uh, with the Manu cave, uh, which was successful even uh, for expansion and migration to Europe. Um, some aspects of uh, the results uh, has been published in this book. I was the um, responsible editor for that. You can uh, have a look uh, to this at the desk of Schweizer Bart. Schweizer Bart is present here, but I have some flyers with me and uh, the book as well, if you're interested in it. Thank you so much indeed for your attention. Thank you so much, Thomas. And now we will move on to our third speaker, Sujil. We are just loading your slides and okay. you can, yes, okay, we have your presentation so the now. the first slide is just to say that today I'm talking to you. I'm here alone, but this work is a work of maybe 50 people for four years and include paleontologists, that means people working on bones, palynologists, as my colleague said, to working on pollen, climate models, working on climate as myself, and niche models that are interested in dynamics of population. The next slide is to introduce what are the problems we want to cope with. We are interested to show that, in fact, the dispersal of our ancestors, especially the apes during Neogen, Neogen is a period from 25 to now, is mostly due to the climate change. Here you can see Africa. What happens over Africa during that time period? So as my other colleagues talk about, there is tectonics and tectonics modify drastically uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And one thing you can see here is a shrinkage of the paratitis. If you were an extraterrestrial and you come to the, to the on the earth 14 million, 15 million years ago, for instance, you will see that a huge, huge sea was covering east of Asia and west of Europe. Uh, a relic out of this huge sea is Mediterranean Sea today. So when this ice, when, when this sea ice retreat little by little, it changed completely the climate of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Why? Because you get a super big continent with eating in the summer, and so this leads to monsoonal climate. This is a very important change, and I will show how this impact drastically on our ancestors. Another thing is, and you can see that, a good place to see that is the Chad Lake that you have, you have here. And the Chad Lake become very, very big in the humid phase of what my, my other colleague told you about. When the, there is a humid phase, the, the, the Chad Lake become as big as France, 400 square kilometer, 400,000 kilometer curve. And, and when it, it, is, it is very narrow, it is just like today. And so there is large and huge differences. And the last thing is the uplift of the African rift. So this has a tectonical events, and I'm very glad to speak the third because I can use what my, my friend said before. The tectonics modify the, 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 the African continent and because of the tectonic, the climate was also modified. So the next slide is to show you where we have found today all, over the Chad Lake two hominids one is, one is very famous, Tumai, 7 million years ago, and the other is Abel, 3.6 million years ago. You can ask you why they were living there. Was it possible to live there? And the result of our study for concerning Australopithecus is the next slide. 
we are able, accounting for geology and accounting for climate, we are able to compute the climate of, the, of this period, and we are able to, to show the suitability area. So this is the fourth slide. You see here the suitability area as predicted by climate model and niche model. And you can see there that the suitability area for Australopithecus are exactly where we know where they are. They are in South Africa, they are in the Eastern corner of Africa, and they are also, because the climate was completely different around the Chad Lake. But the most important result of this first part of Australopithecus is the next slide. During four and three million of years, so the tectonics is no more important because it is just one million of years. What is important is what my other neighbors say. It is the precession, the fact that there is a humid phase and dry phase. And what we can see here, which is the main result, is how this Australopithecus can move. Can they move from the eastern corn of Africa to South Africa? Can they move to the eastern corn Africa to the Chad Lake? And we see here that depending on the precession cycle, there were periods where there were, it was possible to go from Eastern Africa to South or from Eastern Africa to the Chad Lake and period where it was completely impossible. And there are also, we can show also what are the refuge area, the place where you can always live because the condition remains favorable. So this has been published in Global and Planetary Change. The first author is Gilbert and Al. Now I will go to another big travel this time. And this travel is uh, apes travel. Apes is big monkey. That means gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee. You can see on this slide, this, this slide is a, is a slide on, with four, four, four little panels. The nest of this ape begin at the beginning of the Neogen. It is 23 million years ago. And what you can see is that, okay, what is very easy for us to, to simulate it is to simulate the travel they did. How can we do that? We have not any hominids in your computer, no. But hominids, they need fruit all the year. So they need to live in forest, tropical forest. And that we can simulate uh, the climate condition favorable for, for forest. So we can follow the forest. And so we can follow the, following the forest, we can know where potentially where they can go. So what you can see here is the saga of the apes. They live in tropical Africa, they were very happy there. No problems, they get fruit all the year. Well, the climate begins to cool, but there was a, a reversal, which caused mid Miocene climate optimum. And at 17 million years, from 17 to 15 million years, the, the, the tropical forest invaded Europe. And you have pollen records that show that there is a large extension of tropical forest. So the apes, they get out from Africa. They get out from Africa, it's the same story but a bit older uh, during this period because uh, the, 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 the equatorial forest and tropical forest get in to, Europe, to Europe. And we find pollen and bones that are consistent with that. Unfortunately, the climate did continue to cool and cool down. And so they have to leave Europe to go to Asia. And now they're from 7 million years only in Southeastern Asia where they still live. So can we understand this, this big journey of the apes? The next slide is showing you climate results. So what do we need in terms of climate? We simulate the climate thanks to the tectonics and thanks to the orbital forcing, we can compute the climate of the mid Miocene. This is the result that you can see here. On the top, you can see the temperature. What do we need to get tropical forest over Europe? We need to get warmer temperature. And this is what we get in our simulation we get warmer temperature for mid Miocene than present. Okay, it's not enough. We need a seasonal cycle, which is very damp because if it's frozen in winter, no tropical sun. So you see on the, on the panel that the seasonal cycle is largely damp during mid Miocene. But this is not enough. You need a lot of water to get and to sustain tropical forest. And we show here that we get that with By precipitation, we can simulate a climate which is consistent with that. So the next slide is, what we do with this climate, we force a vegetation dynamic model. And what we see here and what you can see on this slide, it is a vegetation change. And you see that as we can expect, and as we know from the paleontologist record, we have indeed tropical forest in this area. 
from our climate simulation. So the, 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 the important result here is to understand that the apes, they don't decide to go out of Africa. The climate made it possible and they did it. And this was the first time they get out from Africa. And then after, due to the cooling, either they go back to Africa, either they decide to continue their large and big trip to southeastern Africa. The, the last, the, not the last, the next slide is the main result of the second part. We are able to understand something which is much more difficult to, 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 to understand. On the, on the left side, you have the niche modeling for 17 million years ago. That means before the big travel. You see that the niche model told you that the apes are restricted to the eastern corner of, of Africa, which is true. This is where we have, we have, we can, we have bones and, 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 and everything we, we need to know that. And then you see what happened three million years later, 14 million years later, they are outside of Africa, they are in Europe, they are in Asia. So what happens? On the right side, you can see that what happened, they go outside from Africa and it is long period of time. So they are also at time to adapt to different climate. The niche modeling is not completely rigid. And what you see on the right side is that the niche modeling of, the, of, of our ancestor 14 million years ago is not the same that the niche, model, that the niche of, the, of the apes 17 million years ago. So we can, we can the, the main result here is that we can understand why they get out of Africa, why they were obliged to leave Europe, and also how much they were able to adapt from East Africa, their nest, to European climate. And the last slide is just a kind of joke. You know, this pluridisciplinary study are long study. You have to discuss with people very different. So we get students that, that are obliged to learn a lot and they are very good. And I hope they will get a permanent job. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all our three speakers. I think we can all agree that you were telling the same fascinating story, but from different perspectives and different time periods. So we truly enjoyed that. We will now move on to the last part of our press conference, which is the question and answer round. So I now open the floor to questions from journalists. If you are in the room and if you have a question, please raise your hand. I will give you the microphone and then you can introduce yourself, your publication or affiliation, and then ask your question. If you are joining us virtually, then you can, you have two options. You can either type in your question in the Zoom chat or you can use the hand raising function and we will unmute you and you can ask your question. So over to you now, if you have any questions coming in for our speakers. Okay, we have one question from a journalist in the room. Hi, and thank you for all your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question, especially about Asia, which is, a, I don't know, um, a bit more. Uh... Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, so I'm Nicolas, and I'm a student journalism in the uh, University of Paris, Paris Cité. And so I used to work on a new species found in the, like, um, in Calaos Island, uh, Homo luzonensis, that was found around five to 10 years ago. And so I was wondering, do you have any insight of how they would be capable of, of of uh, traveling the sea, which is like, which would be the first like appearances of traveling the sea for humans. And what interest would they have in terms of climate since they wouldn't know what climate it looks like, you, it looked like in, in Asia. Um, do you have any idea of how these species was moved to Asia and how the climate would be favorable uh, in this period? Uh, I don't have the idea of uh, at what time exactly they left. I just forgot like the time scale, but uh, you have any idea of how we have this transition from Europe or Africa to, to Asia? Thank you. you. You didn't say any word about the period you are talking about. So it's very important for me or Thomas to answer uh, your question. Uh, I think the fossils was were found, uh, like we found bones of, around 50,000 years ago. Okay. It, it's like the first hypothesis was it was a, a homo um, um, from the Flores Island, mm. Floresensis. 
And so then later they found that the fossils were a bit older than these ones. And so that's that's why they came up with this hypothesis that it's a new species, so Homo resonensis. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, Floris uh, uh, type, yeah. But I'm not an expert, I'm not a paleoanthropologist, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a really an, 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 an own species no? with old roots. And then modern humans came to Asia around uh, 100,000 uh, years, 80,000 years BP. No? And they reached, by the way, uh, Australia around 60,000 up to 80,000 years BP earlier, much earlier than uh, in Europe. That's interesting to note. Yeah. No? But anyway, um, the extinction of uh, these type, uh, ancient type, might be related uh, to the expansion of modern humans. Yeah, yeah you, 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 you're right. In fact, depend. This is why I ask you the question of time. Depending on time, the response are quite different. For instance, uh, what, about what I told you about the the eighth saga. This is million of years. That means that the retreat, the shrinkage of the paradigm is. is enormously important for instance for them to go to asia it was but this is a time about million of years now you're, you're talking about something completely different you are talking about 50 kilo years then it's completely different story so there is a landscape model that are able to more and more correctly reproduce the the landscape nearby the, the place for instance in asia where you find your 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 when you get your finding and these people, they are able to force their, their climate model, their, their, their landscape model with climate for erosion and for local tectonics. And they are able to tell you what kind of way, what kind of pathway they, are, they can take to reach the place where you find it. It is obvious that they don't swim, they don't go there, they don't cross water for, for, for kilometers. So you have really to have a landscape simulation as accurate as you can of the period to try to understand how they can reach this place. But very often you get the idea, oh my God, how they were, for instance, those child lake, oh, they were here. In the because it has completely changed, not only the climate, but the, the landscape too. So this is, this is a short answer to your question. Yeah, but he, he answered quite correctly to your question. You know, the Homo sapiens, they, they, they go from Morocco 330 kilo years before present to Australia 60. And when they did they go to North America and Europe, North Europe, uh, for America, it was only 18 kilo years. Why? Because there were a huge ice cap. And so it was just impossible to go there, except during interglacial, very short period. So there are always very good reason why it, they don't go there. It's just because it's just non suitable. It's just impossible. And this is the reason why you get them going from Africa to Asia, but not, or very few to Europe, and not at all to North America and Canada. Um, may I can add? Um, you have to take into account um, the present day situation, geography, and the paleogeography. And during the last ice age, which uh, does not affect uh, by glaciers in Southeast Asia, let's say, it was not cold. No? But anyway, caused by this huge ice volume, global ice volume, you have an, an enormous um, setback of uh, the sea level, minus 150 meter in comparison to today. And so Sunda Shelf became dry and they could really walk and then some insel hopping to reach, um, let's say, uh, Australia. But this is a narrow time window. And the hobbits, for example, these were a typical insel population, isolated and became small. This is, by the way, I'm a paleontologist. This is quite common in Earth's history, even with elephants <laughs> no? and Sicily, nice uh, uh, <laughs> animals, no? so um, this size, yeah. And uh, the same isolation, nah, and then reduction of the, um, the growth. 
it's generally the rule for you know terrestrial populations that they are much more strongly shaped by mm -hmm. tectonics and landscape and climate than for example marine populations because marine populations are much better interconnected so it's more diffusive environment they can travel better but uh, terrestrial population they have lots of barriers and then you know they're really shaped by this uh, landscape and tectonics and climate evolution okay that was a very nice uh discussion from all speakers we have another question coming in hello i'm javier Orbusano. i'm a freelance journalist i have a question for taras uh, on the first, first hand uh, how do you uh, estimate the amount of planets out there with uh, oceans plate tectonics and so what do you look at to know a, a number and the second uh, it does sound a little bit like a uh, earth centric your analysis like how do you account for things that we might not imagine could be possible? Thank you very much for these questions. I was hoping that somebody will ask question about quantitation because I am the person who does quantitation. Uh, so the, there is very famous Drake equation. So the sense of this equation is the following. So we have to rely on our communication window, which can have you know certain duration. And then since planets they are starting at different times with their star systems. Essentially, we can estimate how many planets will be at approximately the same stage of their evolution within our galaxy by taking into account rate of the star formation and the width of the window. The more stars we form in per unit time and the bigger is our communication window, the better, the more uh, planets we can essentially observe. So this is our basis. And then what people start to estimate is how likely it is for in, for each star to have planets, how many of these planets can be of terrestrial type and have water, how many of these planets can potentially host life, and then this is where our study comes in. So if planet can host life, how big is the probability that, that this simple life will develop into the complex and intelligent life? So our conditions that we put on top of this are ocean and continents. For example, and this is very restrictive condition. Why is it restrictive? Because you cannot vary amount of surface water too much. So if you have too much water, then you just include all continents. There is no continent. So there is no erosion, no delivery of nutrients into oceans, and so on. If you decrease amount of water too much, then essentially what you will do, you will expose so-called mid-ocean ridges, which are one of the products of plate tectonics. Then hydration of the ocean flow at mid-ocean ridges will be suppressed, and this will kill plate tectonics. So again, if we connect ocean continents and plate tectonics, this will create unsuitable conditions for uh, plate tectonics. So then we are sitting within a thin range of how much water is needed to be at the surface. And the trouble is that planets, when they form, they don't care, you know, how much water is delivered. You can deliver anything from purely dry wall to ocean wall. So you can create something like Enceladus or some, you know, other uh, icy satellites, and then there will be 50% water. So 50% water will never allow for coexistence of uh, oceans and continents because everything will be flooded since, you know, topographic variation, they even... Um, you know, independent of the planetary side. So then what you have to do to compute this probability, you take your range, which is allowed, and then you, you divide it over the range, which is expected. And then you get very small number because you are trying to reach some kind of Goldilocks condition. So you really aim at, at very teeny amounts of variation. And this is not possible from the planetary perspective uh, condition to be kind of self-regulated. So similarly for plate tectonics, again, there are conditions for plate tectonics which, you know, permit this process on the on a planet of terrestrial type. So one of them is, of course, availability of water, but then in addition to them, certain planetary composition, certain planetary size. And again, if you look for variability and then just compare your expected range uh, uh, of, of, uh, or your permitted range of variation, with expected range of variation, then you again get very small number. So this is how one can come to these numbers. Initially, we were not even believing that these numbers could be computed. But in fact, there is very good literature in astronomy 
and in, in earth sciences, which where these questions are discussed, and then we can come with some quantitations. But of course, these are not the only factors which may affect life on a planet. There are other factors such as presence of magnetic field and, and, and so on. So expectation will be that you can only decrease probability of civilizations with adding more factors because then you will find less and less and less planets where these additional conditions will be satisfied. And then in the end, in fact, we will have less and less and less civilizations to be expected. So, but on the other hand, as my colleague Bob Stern is, is telling, are we really looking for, you know, planets with civilizations or other planets with primitive life which we can, you know, then explore and, and, and populate. So perhaps we don't need civilizations because uh, who knows what is going to happen with this. I, I, may, I may add something uh, much more terrestrial than climate. You know, on Earth, the climate, the, the life is there from 3.6 million of years. That means that the climate has always been suitable. We, we have been frozen, but not so long. Most of the time, the climate was favorable. And one very little thing that is very important, in fact, is that we have a big satellite, the moon. Why is it so important? It is very important because the moon, just because it is there, is as for, for effect to, to make the obliquity of our planet very stable. And an obliquity very stable is a very good condition for a climate very stable. So only, only here on the Earth, we see that we have condition, as my colleagues say, tectonics, of course, many conditions. But moreover, we have the chance to, that there is big, this, big, this big collision for 4.2 billion of years that creates the moon. And the moon has a very beneficial effect on the Earth. By the way, you know that the obliquity in Greek, it, 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 it means climate. This is what the world come from. So there are many, many conditions for life to sustain for millions of years. As, as my colleagues say, galactic condition, but also more planetary condition and climate that makes it possible to develop for many, many, many million of years. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? There don't seem to be any questions from our virtual attendees either. So if there are no more questions from journalists in the room, I think we are ready to end our press briefing here. Thank you again very much uh, to all three speakers. If you would like to have formal or informal interviews or chats with the speakers, feel free to reach out to me and I will be happy to put you in touch with them uh, throughout the EGU23 week. The entire recording of this press conference will be available later today. So you can refer to that on EGU's YouTube channel for more reference. Um, and I would also like to add that if you're sticking around, we have our next press conference at 11.30 today. Um, the title is Early Warning for Extreme Events, Earthquakes, Droughts, Floods, and Livestock Disease. So hope to see some of you there. And thank you very much again. Thank you very All right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.